Bienvenue, chers collègues, à ce premier événement de l'année de l'Institut de recherche sur la science, la société et la politique publique. Il nous fait un énorme plaisir de vous accueillir ici à l'Université d'Ottawa. Pour ceux et celles qui ne me connaissent, qui, qui ne me connaissent pas, je m'appelle Monica Gattinger et je suis la directrice de l'Institut et professeur à l'École d'études politiques ici à l'Université d'Ottawa. When I was appointed director of the ISSP last fall, my three top priorities were and remain to increase the research profile of the Institute, including through engagement with other academic and non-academic partners here in Ottawa and beyond, to expand our public outreach and to use the incredible platform that we have at the ISSP to stimulate debate, exploration, and serious consideration of leading issues of the day in the nexus between science, society, and policy, and to expand our student training activities to develop the next generation of leaders operating in an increasingly <coughs> multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and transdisciplinary science, society, policy context. With this first, first panel of the year, I'd like to think we're doing this in spades. It is our pleasure to convene a panel on one of the most salient issues of science, society, and poly policy of our time, gene editing and the governance of gene editing. We have with us today some of the world's foremost experts in this area, a number of whom are gathering in Ottawa for an OECD workshop on this topic. We are so delighted they all agreed to be with us here this evening. Gene editing and the governance of gene editing is one of the key policy areas the Institute is focusing on in our newer research project that's called At Risk, which explores the democratization of risk management in areas where risk perception and risk assessment can differ substantially between experts and the general public. That we have organized this panel in close partnership with Genome Canada is a manifestation of our desire to forge closer relationships with government and non-government bodies grappling with these core questions. That a number of the panelists hail from universities that the Institute and the university writ large is in the process of, of establishing much closer ties with attests to our desire to forge solid, productive, and mutually beneficial research relationships with like-minded institutions. <coughs> It is through the generous support of Genome Canada that we were able to hold such a lovely reception this evening. I'd like to invite you to join me in thanking Genome Canada for their support. In addition, that we have senior leaders in the room today from the three federal granting councils, SHRC, NSERC, and CIHR, gives us great honor and pleasure. It is also our pleasure to have a good number of students in the room with us today as well, a number of whom are working on the at-risk project thanks to some seed funding from SHRC. Without further ado, let's get on with our program. We are delighted to have with us Dr. Cindy Bell, Executive Vice President, Corporate Development from Genome Canada, to say a few words of welcome. I would note that Dr. Bell is not only a long-standing senior executive with Genome Canada, but she holds a PhD in genetics from McGill University and was a researcher at the University of California, Riverside, where she investigated the basic defect in cystic fibrosis. Dr. Bell. Thank you, Monica. Um, we're really pleased that this event actually came together, and so thank you, Monica, and your team, and Natalie Brender from Genome Canada for uh, making it happen, and of course, to the experts who are going to present to us tonight, and my dear colleague and friend, Eric Meslin, who has agreed to moderate it. Um, and we're sponsoring this event because we really do understand the importance of being prepared for new technologies. Genomics, of course, was considered, uh, I think the, the term was first coined in 1986. It's still a relatively new technology, and it is it has come along the path with some bumps and warts. And I think through Genome Canada's program called GELS, we tried to address a number of those issues in advance so that we could have a smooth uptake of genomics technologies in all of the sectors that we investigate. So that's why this program is so important, because this wonderful new technology of gene editing, although it comes with great opportunities, 
you know, the possibilities of treating disease, of uh, breeding new crops that can adapt to climate change, protecting our environment, comes with challenges as well. And I think one of the challenges that you are going to hear about tonight and talk about is the governance issues. We need to make sure that we have in place the appropriate governance. We need to ensure we also have in place the appropriate reg regulatory framework in which to operate. Um, taking into consideration, of course, risk. You know, you have to regulate at, at the level of the risk that's involved. And I think gene editing creates a really unique experiment for us to think about because of the uh, relationship that we hear about with GMOs, which I think we have to make sure that we carve a much better path than we did for that, well, for gene editing. And it's really excellent to know that your institute, Monica, is so devoted to addressing issues like this. I think it's really important and it's important in in uh, the framework of, of an academic environment, but it, it impacts all of the sectors across Canada. And I'm really pleased, as you pointed out, to see our colleagues from the um, uh, granting councils here. We have some from the federal departments. We have members present and past from Genome Canada's Science and Industry Advisory Committee, representatives from the Canadian Genomic Centres across uh, Canada. And so I think we'll have a really good um, engagement tonight, and again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cindy, for those kind words. Um, I now would have introduced Dr. Ruby Heap, who is Associate Vice President Research at the University of Ottawa. Uh, Dr. Heap, unfortunately, had some last minute changes in her travel uh, schedule, so unfortunately won't be with us tonight, but she did share with me the remarks that she would uh, have given. Uh, but what I would like to begin by saying is that Ruby has done so much, for those of you who know her, she's done so much to expand interdisciplinary research and teaching at the University of Ottawa and is an unflagging supporter of the ISSP. She's a core member of the Institute and she's also a member of our advisory council. Her research, as many of you would know, specialize in the history, specializes in the history of women uh, in science. For this evening's event, Ruby asked me to share with you that the Office of the Vice President Research strongly supports the work of the ISSP. Uh, the ISSP is one of the university's research institutes that works in strategic areas identified by the University of Ottawa, specifically e-society and Canada and the world, including public policy, as Dr. Bell just noted. In addition, we have Fulbright research chairs that are now attached uh, to the institute, as well as a research project led by Dr. Mark Sonner, my predecessor, uh, which recently received seed funding from the Office of the Vice President Research in its new program to support pro projects with American researchers. Now, in Dr. Heap's stead, I was delighted to see today that Francois Carrier, who is the director of our International Research Office, uh, is with us, and he has agreed to say a few words of welcome. Francois. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Just a few minutes to thank everybody in the room on behalf of the Vice President Research Office, our distinguished guests as well, panelists. Uh, I hope you'll have great discussions. Uh, what's taking place today is but one example of the great work this particular institute uh, is doing at the, at the scale of the world, uh, about issues of a global scale. And uh, that we are trying from our end of things to uh, support in any possible ways with funding at times through various means, uh, but also with uh, all sorts of other support that we can provide to uh, move this university and its experts uh, on, uh, on the global sta uh, st stage. So thank you very much again for this, uh, this opportunity to thank everybody to be, for being here and enjoy the panel discussions. Thank you, Francois, and I think it goes without saying that uh, we really value, uh, value the support. Um, so now, uh, for the main attraction. We are so pleased to have with us this evening some of the world's foremost experts in the governance uh, of gene editing. I'll briefly pr present each of them now, and it will be in the order in which, um, in which they will speak, and then I will turn things over to our moderator for the evening, uh, Eric Meslin. Uh, so starting beside Eric is Jason Delborn, who is Professor of Science, Policy, and Society with the Department of Forestry and Environmental Resources, as well as with the Genetic Engineering and Society Center at North Carolina State University. 
Jason's research focuses on highly politicized scientific controversies, so obviously he's in the right place. <laughs> he engages qualitative research methodologies to ask questions about how policymakers and members of the public interface with controversial science. In 2010, he received the David Edge Prize, awarded annually, annually by the Society for Social Studies of Science for the best journal article published in the area of science and technology studies. He recently completed service on a National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine Committee that evaluated the prospects for gene drive research in non-human organisms, and that is what he's going to be speaking with us about uh, this evening. To uh, Jason's left, your right, is Professor Vardit Ravitsky. Uh, she's at the Bioethics Program with the Department of Social and Preventative Medicine at l'Université de Montréal. She is also Director of the Ethics and Health Branch of the CRE, an inter-university research center in ethics. She is board member and ethics designate, designate of the CIHR's Institute of Genetics and co-chairs the Institute's GELS and Health Services and Policy Research Priority and Planning Committee. That is a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> And there's a lot of acronyms in there as well. <laughs> Professor Ravitsky's research focuses on reproductive ethics and the ethics of, gen of genetic and genomics research. She is particularly interested in the various ways in which cultural frameworks shape public debate and public policy in the area of bioethics. Beside Dr. Ravitsky is Dr. Gary Marchand, who is Regents Professor of Law and Faculty Director and Faculty Fellow at the Center for Law, Science and Innovation, Arizona State University. Dr. Marchand's research interests include the use of genetic information in environmental regulation, risk and the precautionary principle, legal aspects of personalized medicine, and regulation of emerging technologies such as nanotechnology, neuroscience and biotechnology. He is a distinguished sustainability scientist at ASU's Global Institute of Sustainability, and I, ha I have a student who just came back from there, and she had the most marvelous uh, experience. Thank you so much. Prior to joining the college faculty in 1999, Professor Marchand was a partner at the Washington, D.C. office of Kirkland & Ellis, where his practice focused on environmental and administrative law. Among other activities, he has served on four National Research Council committees, has been the principal investigator on several major grants, and has organized numerous academic conferences on law and science issues. Our final panelist is Professor Brenda Wilson, School of Epidemiology, Public Health, and Preventative Medicine. She's also a core member of the ISSP here at the University of Ottawa. Brenda Wilson trained in medicine at the Universities of St. Andrews and Edinburgh in the UK and did residency training in internal medicine and public health medicine. She joined the Department of Epidemiology and Community Medicine at the University of Ottawa, now it's a school, in 2002. She is a founding member of the Institute for Science Society of Policy, thank you, <laughs> and of the Center for Health, Law, Policy and Ethics, also here at the University. Her research applies a public health lens to emerging health technologies, particularly genomics. She is interested in questions relating to the evidence for genome-based tests and health interventions, different service delivery models, and the personal, family, and social implications of genomics. Since 2015, Dr. Wilson has been a member of the Canadian Task Force for Preventative Care. When we were organizing this panel, our minds turned to identifying a moderator for the event. One name, and one name alone, was raised. It has to be Eric. <laughs> and we were very pleased that he said yes. It has been my absolute pleasure to come to know Eric since he was appointed president and CEO of the Council of Community Academies earlier this year. Feels like I've known you a lot longer, so I think that must be part of the reason why you're so successful in, uh, in your work. Um, not only does Me Dr. Meslin preside the council, but as many of you know, he is also an internationally renowned expert in genomics. Dr. Meslin came to the council from Indiana University, where he was founding director of the Center for Bioethics for 15 years, associate dean for bioethics in the School of Medicine, and professor of medicine, of medical and molecular genetics, of bioethics and law, of public health, and of philosophy. How many more departments did you go and you know, <laughs> hop around in over there? In 2012, Dr. Meslin was appointed IU's first endowed professor of bioethics. 
Prior to Indiana, Eric was Bioethics Research Director of the Ethical, Legal, and Social Implications Program at the U.S. National Human Genome Research Institute, and then Executive Director of the National Bioethics Advisory Commission, appointed by then President Bill Clinton. And get him talking about Bill Clinton. We did a dinner one weekend, it was lots of fun. Born in Canada, Dr. Meslin received his BA from York University and his MA and PhD from Georgetown, both in philosophy and bioethics. Among his many honours, Dr. Meslin is a fellow of the Canadian Academy <coughs> of Health Sciences and a Chevalier de l'Ordre National du Mérite for contributions to French bioethics. Eric? Over to you. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> uh, well, my job is, uh, thank you, Monica, that was a very um, generous and unnecessarily long um, uh, recitation. It just means I've been around a while and can't find a permanent job, I guess. Um, uh, my job as moderator is really just to um, welcome you and uh, essentially get out of the way and let the, uh, the real experts uh, have something to say. But for those who know me, I couldn't just do that. I do want to maybe make a couple of observations uh, to put some of this into context. Uh, not only is it a spectacular opportunity that uh, Monica and her team have put together um, here at the Institute University of Ottawa, right in the middle of some of the most exciting policy conversations that are going on, on a daily basis it seems. You cannot turn your head uh, without, uh, uh, without seeing a discussion of, of genetics or genomics, in the case of CRISPR-Cas9, uh, something uh, like it. And yet, this is reminiscent of uh, some other times and other places when these kinds of conversations uh, have occurred. Uh, in fact, I'm, in a way, if I were to summarize, and we did this a little bit on the telephone as a prep for our, our call, uh, summarize what makes uh, CRISPR technology itself uh, transformative or disruptive or any of the cool terms we like to throw around to pretend we're, uh, we're smart, um, it seems to collect under one umbrella many of the ethical, legal, social, and governance issues that have preoccupied uh, public and international attention for about 35 or 40 years. Um, and you, you know what the list is. The list begins at least um, in 1978 with the birth of Louise Brown. It continues on with, with the Asilomar meetings. It goes on to uh, other forms of uh, genetic and genomic manipulation, the entire human genome project and all of its uh, progeny. Uh, it includes gene therapy. Um, there is probably no topic, and it's hard to say this without sounding overly hyperbolic, there, are, there is perhaps no topic that I can think of in recent memory, except perhaps for HIV AIDS in the early 80s, that covered the gamut, almost from, uh, from A to Z, of the issues at the intersection of clinical, research, policy, regulatory, uh, theology, philosophy, every one of the social sciences that you can think of any one of the natural sciences that you can think of. There is no agency or department represented in this room, either the leadership or the recipients of funding, whose work is not now or will soon be test or will not be tested by this technology. That's a dramatic statement going from agriculture to zoology. There, I did the A to Z. <laughs> and that's not kidding. Um, but what I think makes it fascinating and why I'm delighted to, uh, to really pay, step back and, and, uh, and watch like you are until we have a conversation is that not only are these topics um, internationally interesting, every country, or it seems that virtually every country has, a, has an oar uh, that they are paddling uh, in this stream, but so too are we at a moment when the public is so actively interested and engaged. And I don't just mean the Twitterverse that uh, captures conversations that way. I mean an active uh, public who is wondering about the uses and misuses of a set of technologies, not simply one, and a set of technologies not only applied to humans, but also to animals and agriculture and the whole list. So it is truly a, a, a cornucopia, and one for which I think we are uniquely positioned 
uh, not only here in Canada and because there's an OECD meeting and a lot of other things happening, but I think the world is watching, um, to, to borrow a phrase. Uh, so I'm just ever so delighted and grateful to you, Monica, for, uh, for the invitation to uh, moderate. It's not going to be refereeing. We're going to let our panelists uh, do their work. Just some housekeeping, end of my remarks, a couple of housekeeping rules for how I think this might work well. We're going to let each of our um, speakers do their thing, uh, but I will allow you, if it's okay, a, a, quarter, a quick question or two of after each uh, one. You don't want to get to the very end and you forget what you were going to um, ask Jason. That's always a little awkward. So we will have some discussion, a couple of questions perhaps after each, and then we'll have a fulsome conversation when, uh, when everyone's done. So that's the plan. Uh, thank you all, and without further ado, uh, thank you.